Fighting games are an endless horizon of memorable characters, diverse mechanics, creative art styles and designs, mountains of lore, and players from so many walks of life all over the world. But if we travel through this universe, all the way to the center, to the spot where the Big Bang occurred that gave birth to everything that we know, you'll find Street Fighter. This was the franchise that started it all, and it's continued to be one of the biggest forces in not just the fighting game genre, but in video games in general. To this day, whenever a new Street Fighter is released, it feels like the start of a new era. It feels like an event. And guess what? After seven years, that new era is finally here again. A brand new Street Fighter is finally being released, and it's got the FGC excited in a way that I haven't seen in years. So in honor of this newest installment, today we are going to go all the way back to where this legend began, to explore the highs and lows and highs again and lows again of this epic series. Welcome, World Warriors, to the Street Fighter Retrospective. And welcome to our Street Fighter retrospective, and I'm not even going to try and hide this for some big reveal later on. This is going to be another multi-part episode because, well, it's Street Fighter. Its development, its roster, its impact is so great, it would be impossible to cover it all in a single episode. Even one of my monumental feature-length episodes. So this is going to be a four-part series, and if you like what you're watching, then make sure that you click that subscribe button and ring that bell so that way you won't miss the next part. Now, without further ado... Let's head back, further back than we've ever had to travel in one of these retrospectives, to the 1980s. Now, four decades ago, fighting games weren't exactly what they are today. Hell, no video game genre was. This was still the Wild West when everyone was trying to figure out not just the best way to make a game, but what the heck a game even was. It was a very experimental time, and one such experimental developer was Takashi Nishiyama. A man I've talked about so many times on this show, he might as well be the fighting game retrospective mascot. If you've been with us for a while, then you'll remember Nishiyama as the creator of Fatal Fury, and Art of Fighting, and the co-creator of King of Fighters, and the producer of... The Rumblefish. The Rumblefish. So if you're talking about figures who have been instrumental in the birth of this genre, Takashi Nishiyama will always come up. He's like the Stan Lee of fighting games. And back in 1984, Nishiyama was working as a designer for a game called Kung Fu Masters, or Spartan X in Japan. This was considered to be the very first beat-em-up game, where you would scroll from side to side fighting waves of enemies, all leading up to various boss fights. Now, as he was developing this game, Nishiyama thought about what it would be like if you just cut out all the random faceless enemies, and this game was nothing but boss fights. Just a game where you take on colorful characters with their own unique moves, one right after another. Now today you hear that and you think, that's just a fighting game arcade ladder, that's basic stuff. Sure, it's basic now, but not back then. That's how far back we're going right now. We are living in the day and age of the omelet, but to get here, somebody had to be that first person who looked at an egg and said, okay, hear me out. So Nishiyama made Kung Fu Masters for the video game developer Irem, and it was a big success. But just a year before this, in 1983, the founder of Irem, Kenzo Sujimoto, had been forced out of the company as he had been blamed for the declining sales of the company's standout shooter, IPM Invaders, which was basically a Space Invaders spinoff that had been licensed from Taito. 
Now, why am I bringing up Kenzo Sujimoto? Because after being forced to leave Iram, he picked himself back up and he founded the brand new company, Capsule Computers, better known as Capcom. And he began looking to some of the big names from Iram to recruit them for his new studio, maybe because he knew firsthand what talented developers they were, or maybe because he was spiteful that he'd been forced out of Iram and he was going to try and rip that company apart from the inside out by taking all their best staff. Who can say? Well, either way, Sujimoto ended up recruiting Nishiyama to come and work for him at Capcom, where he would put Nishiyama to work on a brand new title. A title that would allow players to actually go head to head with each other in Capcom's very first fighting game. Not yet! Ah, there it is. This is Trojan, released in arcades in 1986, and while even the most diehard Capcom fans have probably never even heard of this, this is actually a very unique footnote in the company's history. This game is a beat-em-up set in a post-apocalyptic world, but the reason why this is so important is because when Trojan came to the NES in December of that same year, they added in there a two-player versus mode, where players would fight in a best two out of three match format. Which means, by the loosest definition of the words, this was the first fighting game that Capcom made. Or more accurately, the first blueprint for a fighting game. This was Capcom experimenting with the idea of making a game where two players could fight each other. I doubt it was the make it or break it pitch for Street Fighter, that was probably already in the works at this point. It was more of a test to make sure they actually could do this before they started putting money towards making new arcade cabinets. Both this test run out of the way, Nishiyama would begin working on bringing his vision to life. Now, I've been talking like fighting games were something brand new, and they were, but there were a few other titles at the time that were pioneers in the domain of fisticuffs such as Karate Champ, which many people have hailed as the progenitor of fighting games, or Yi Ar Kung Fu, a game by Konami that featured your protagonist going up against a string of other fighters, very similar to the idea that Nishiyama himself had had when making Kung Fu Masters. Nishiyama took ideas from both of these titles and was then teamed up with the game's designer, Hiroshi Masumoto, and the two of them started working on their vision for Street Fighter. Now, I should point out that IGN has reported that this game got its name from the American title of the 1974 Sunny Shiba film, and a lot of people report that as being true, but I've never found any interview from anyone at Capcom confirming this. Instead, according to an interview in Udon's Street Fighter Artwork Extreme book in 2012, Nishiyama said he wanted to call it Street Fighter to make it sound like a fight could break out anywhere. But he did say that this fight anywhere kind of mentality was based on martial arts films that he used to watch which did inspire the direction that he wanted this game to go. I think even if one-on-one -on -one fights were replaced with actual martial arts, it would lack entertainment. A more cinematic, anime-like, novel-like narrative was necessary, and a fight that broke out in a happening way was vital to that. That's why I named it Street Fighter. The things that can be expressed in a game are limited, but I wanted to make it so you could feel a story that would make your heart skip a beat. Yeah, as you can tell, Nishiyama had big ideas and big goals for this title. He was envisioning a whole world around this game. And was he able to bring that world to life? Well, let's all try to remember that this game was made back when everyone was trying to figure out that whole video game thing. Street Fighter would release in arcades in August of 1987, and this is such an interesting game to talk about because this is where it all began. Street Fighter, one of the most universally recognized and applauded fighting games ever, all started here. And yet I guarantee you a good chunk of our audience doesn't even know this game exists. I'm not kidding, when I was a kid I remember so many people pointing to Street Fighter 2 and saying, yeah that was the first Street Fighter, with no hint of sarcasm. In the day and age of the internet where you have all the information you could need at your fingertips, it might seem wild, but I promise you in the 90s, a good chunk of people legit did not know that there was a Street Fighter before Street Fighter 2, despite the giant number 2 in its title. So let's delve into this game and see what exactly it has to offer, think about why so many people have forgotten about, and ask, is there something special here? The game starts Ryu, a young martial arts master on his way to challenge a colorful cast of characters across the world. For anyone more familiar with the later Street Fighters, or let's just say fighting games in general, it might shock you to learn that Ryu was the only playable character in this game. Although you could be challenged by another player, at which point the challenger would only be able to select Ken, who was just a color swap of Ryu with the exact same moveset. In the arcade mode, there are 10 opponents that you'll have to face. 
Retsu, a Shirinjo Kimpo instructor, Geki, a ninja, Joe, an underground martial arts champion, Mike, a heavyweight boxer, Lee, a Baji Kwan expert, Gin, an agent assassin, Birdie, a punk bouncer, Eagle, an Eskrima carrying bodyguard, Adon, a Muay Thai student, and Sagat, Adon's master who goes by the title, The Emperor of Muay Thai. Now, normally I'd go into more detail about these characters, but I'll let you know right now, there really isn't anything to them in this game. Which is a shame, because Nishiyama has said that he wanted to give every single one of these characters a rich story. In a 2011 interview with 1UP.com, he said, quote, I wanted there to be a story so it would feel like a movie. We even conceptualized details for the characters that we didn't put into the game itself. What the character might like to eat, do they have sisters, other family members, etc. Street Fighter was different from prior games in the amount of depth that we gave these characters. Right. Depth. Well, while I totally believe that Nishiyama did think up a whole story and background for each of these characters, and they did include some of the details that he wrote up in the arcade flyers that Capcom sent out to promote this game, when it came to the actual in-game characterizations... Yeah, every character had the exact same win and loss quotes, and that was it. So when it comes to characters and story details, there isn't really much worth talking about in this game. But about half the roster of this game would return for later installments, so I will go into details on them when we get to the sequels. However, I will applaud just how distinct each of these characters were. They each had their own specific designs, their own unique special moves, and their own stages, which for 1987 was very ahead of its time and did contribute a lot to this game's personality. In fact, I'll go ahead and say, I think probably the best thing about this game is the stages. The British stage with the castle in the background, the Chinese stage sound the Great Wall, when you compare this game to stages in other video games released in 1987, these are really impressive. And to further help these characters stand out, they were each given big portraits that would flash on screen before and after the fights. And do you know who drew these portraits? Guess. Go ahead, guess. You'll never come up with it. It's wild, I promise you. It's crazy. Go on, guess. Give up? Ready to be surprised? Here we go. These portraits in the original Street Fighter were created by... Keiji Inafune. <laughs> Yes, legendary game developer Keiji Inafune got his very first job in video games making these portraits for Street Fighter. And from there, his career would take off as he became one of the biggest designers for the Mega Man series, producing the Onimusha and Dead Rising series, and attempting to destroy Capcom from the inside in the late 2000s. So here's to you, Keiji Inafune. Every time I see Zagat's giant butt chin, I'll think about how I'm not holding a copy of Mega Man Legends 3 in my hands. Anyway, back to the positives, I also have to give this game some credit for giving you the ability to mix up the order in which you fight the enemies. When the game begins, you can choose Japan or America, which I originally thought meant you would be able to choose between Ryu and Ken, seeing as how they both play the same and Ryu is from Japan, Ken is from America. But no, what this decides is the order in which you will fight the enemies. There are five scenes in this game with two fights in each country. America, Japan, China, England, and Thailand. If you select Japan, then the order goes Japan, America, China, England, Thailand. If you choose America, then it goes America, Japan, England, China, and Thailand remains as the final stage. And since the difficulty increases as you go through the game and each stage keeps the same characters, this does allow players to think about which characters they want to fight at different difficulties. So if you know one character in particular gives you trouble, selecting the pattern that would let you face them earlier would really help you out. That's actually pretty smart. And whenever you move from one location to another, you would be given mini games where you would have to break bricks or boards, which was only there for scoring points, but it was a nice way to spice up the game and give it some variety, which would become another tradition for fighting games moving forward. So there actually is a lot of positives to say about this game. But there's way more negatives. Yeah, I've been putting off talking about the combat in this fighting game because it is, to put it bluntly, bad. Very, very bad. In fact, I've heard multiple people over the years say this is a competitor for one of the worst fighting games of all time, which I'm not willing to agree with. I've played far worse myself. And again, this was 1987. You do have to give it a little bit of leeway. But even taking the time into account, yeah, there's no saving this combat. To begin with, this is a six button fighter, light, medium, and heavy punch, light, medium, and heavy kick. 
The light attacks do less damage but are faster, and the heavy attacks do more damage but are slower. Again, for the time, this was very smart and inventive, have to give them credit on that. So, why am I bringing it up as a negative? Well, that's because the original Street Fighter might have been one of the most broken arcade games in history. And I don't mean broken as in unfair, although... There's certainly an argument to be made for that. No, when I say broken, I mean when this game was originally released, it only had two buttons. One for punches and one for kicks. So, how did that work? Well, you'll have to hit these big rubber buttons and how hard you hit it would decide the strength of the attack that you threw out. Capcom did this to try and make just pressing the buttons feel fun, something more interactive, almost like it's a carnival game. But I want you all to stop and think for a second about what probably happened when you told a bunch of kids in the arcade that the harder they hit a button, the stronger their attack became. Uh. <laughs> yep, these two button versions of the game were constantly being broken because people just started pounding on them like a gorilla trying to open a suitcase. And even if you didn't break the machine, guess what? Punching your fist into a big rubber pad all day? Not going to feel good on your knuckles. And that's if you hit the pad. Let's say that you get a little too in the game and you start swinging your fist around a little too loosely. You slam your hand down and miss the pad completely and hit the edge of the machine instead. Now your knuckle is cut wide open and you're trying to explain to your doctor while he's stitching you up that this was all because of an arcade machine. Street Fighter 1 is the only fighting game in history that actually fought back. And because of this, the original release of Street Fighter sold well under expectations. So quickly after the game came out, Capcom put out a six-button version of the cabinet, meaning that even back in the 80s, fighting games still had to get day one patches. Capcom would then rename the two-button version the Deluxe Edition. Well, I guess Deluxe can mean rare, so considering that most of them were destroyed, sure, I guess that works. So, okay, the Deluxe Machines were a flop, but they did correct that with another version that had the proper button layout, meaning that you could now enjoy the gameplay as it was intended. So, uh... How was the gameplay exactly? No, Ryu, that was not all right. Nothing about any of this is all right. Everything feels very stiff from the punching to the jumping. It all feels just way too rigid, which I can partly forget because again, it was 1987. A lot of games felt stiff back then. But surprisingly enough, the game is also incredibly fast. Some rounds can go on for a bit as your characters just hop back and forth, but when you get higher into the arcade ladder, it's just you and your opponent jumping and punching like mad, and then it's over in five seconds. It's like having a fighting game between two soda balls that you just shook up and let go. Nishiyama said that he based the combat in this game around what he had seen in Bruce Lee films, as well as martial arts that Nishiyama himself had practiced, and if that's true, then I have several questions about who was teaching him martial arts and how much he was being charged for those lessons. But honestly, don't worry about your attacks or your spacing or your neutral or anything like that, because if you want to win this game, the secret tech is just to not even attack and spend all your time trying to do specials. Yes, another important note about Street Fighter and a positive that I do have to give this game is just how forward thinking it was. This was the first fighting game to ever introduce special moves at least in the way that we would come to think of special moves. I'm sure someone is going to argue that Yi Ar Kung Fu had special moves, seeing as how your character did different attacks based on what direction you were pressing when you hit the button. But you ask me, that's just a command normal. Street Fighter actually gave Ryu unique moves that would be performed by pressing button combinations with a unique motion on the joystick. Again, I know that today I don't need to explain to you what a special move is, but it has to be stated, what I just said was brand new territory at the time. There were three special moves. A projectile called the Hadouken, performed by moving the controller down, forward, and hitting a punch. A rising punch, called the Shoryuken, performed by pressing a punch after hitting forward, down, and down forward, sort of making a Z motion. And a spinning kick that propelled you forward, called the Tatsumaki, done by pressing down, to back, and kick. In English, these attacks were dubbed into Psycho Fire, Dragon Punch, and Hurricane Kick respectively, but in the later games, they would stick with the official names. And these moves would become the blueprint for almost every fighting game move set after this. Most 2D fighters after this point would feature a character that had some kind of an ability that could be performed by pressing down to forward and punch. Or you would have some kind of a rising attack that was done by the Z motion and a punch. 
In fact, this moveset would become so iconic that it would spawn an entire class of fighters. In fighting games, characters who have a projectile, a rising invincible attack, and a kick that sends you forward are known as Shotos, which was short for Shotokan, the fighting style that was practiced by Ryu. Heck, just the Hadouken itself is easily the most famous fighting game move ever. Everyone knows the Hadouken. Although it is worth pointing out that the Hadouken isn't entirely original. Nijiyama would admit that he got the idea for this famous attack from a popular anime. Yeah, you all probably know where I'm going with this. The Hadoho from the 1970s space battleship Yamato. Okay, maybe you didn't know where I was going with this. Yeah, most people think that this was based on the Kamehameha from Dragon Ball, and that is possible, but considering that Dragon Ball's anime came out just one year before Street Fighter, I don't know if Nishiyama would have seen it. I don't know how up to date on brand new anime he was when he was pumping out three video games a year. No, instead, he says they got the inspiration for this from the laser blast called Wave Motion Gun, or Hadoho, from Space Battleship Yamato, and even though admittedly the Hadouken doesn't really look anything like it, it would take on more of a laser blast appearance in the later Versus games. So, these special moves were groundbreaking, and they would become iconic and influential for the future of fighting games. So again, why am I listing them under the negatives? Because these special moves are busted, and I mean that in almost every definition of the word. Your regular attacks barely chip away at the opponent, but your special moves take a third of their health away with each hit, and the Shoryuken and the Tatsu could hit your opponent multiple times. And if you hit your opponent when they're attacking you, then there is a chance that for some reason the computer would read that as two hits instead of one, which means if you hit your opponent at just the right time with just the right move, you can basically one-shot them. So this game didn't just invent special moves, it also invented the Arc System style insta-kills. And the same thing goes for your opponents too, they also have special moves of their own, and they also decimate your life points. I apologize to anyone who blinked right then and missed that whole match. So the special moves do an insane amount of damage and can be bugged to do even more damage. So is there any kind of a balance to them to make them more fair? Yes, in the worst possible way. That's because when it comes to reading your inputs, the computer is practically illiterate. You can input the command for the Hadouken five times in a row, exactly the same way every single time, and only one of those inputs will actually work if you're lucky. And there is no correct way to input the buttons. It's not like it isn't reading your inputs because you're hitting them too fast or too slow or you need to take a pause in between when you hit the buttons. No, it just doesn't read your inputs most of the time. So the only way to win is to hit your opponent with specials in a game that can barely ever read your specials, all while jumping and hopping around like you're on a sugar high. So in case it wasn't obvious, yeah, this game isn't very good. The only reason that I would recommend someone return to the original Street Fighter today would be purely for curiosity or for historical purposes. Just so that way you can experience what fighting games were like back in 1987 and see how much this game has changed over that time. And luckily, you can now finally do that, because for the longest time, this game was locked on arcades, with the only home ports being renamed to Fightin' Streets, which was released on PCs in Japan in 1988, and on the Turbo Graphics in 1989, neither of which had six buttons for you to press. Mean which attacks came out were determined by how long you held down the buttons, making your timing on these inputs even harder. But six years ago, the Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection finally gave players a way to experience an arcade-perfect reproduction of this game. Although, I should also mention this because I know there will be tons of comments about it. Normally, I do not cover fan games on these retrospectives, but in the past year, someone did actually make a competitive version of Street Fighter 1 that lets you play as all the characters, fixes all the broken inputs, and actually makes the game play okay. So thanks to the fans, there actually now is a way to play a fun, functioning version of this game. Now, as I said, the deluxe two-button version of this game did not sell well, estimated to have barely sold 1,000 units. But the six-button version of the game did much better. Amazing what making a game not designed to be busted open like a pinata will do for your sales. Now, how much these six-button units sold is unknown, even by Capcom themselves. In 2020, Polygon held a roundtable with several Street Fighter developers, including Nishiyama himself, 
and none of them could agree on how much it sold, with estimates ranging between 10 and 50,000 units. That's kind of a large gap. However, we do know that according to Japanese magazine Game Machine, it was the fifth most popular machine in September of 1987, a month after the game was released, then the third most popular in October, and then the number one game in January of the next year. Which lets me know that the more the six-button version of the game became available, the more people wanted to play it because even the people who weren't going to smash the game open still found just hammering their fists in these big rubber buttons over and over again kind of hurt. And apparently the game sold higher copies in America than in Japan, which was a market that Capcom wanted to break into, so even if this didn't do huge numbers, it was enough for Capcom to pursue a sequel. Even if not everyone from the first game would be there for the ride. You see, playing for Street Fighter 2 began in October of 1988, just a year after the first game came out, and a few months after Nishiyama left Capcom. Yes, the guy who made the original game left the company, and Capcom was like, Welp! Time to make a sequel! As I pointed out earlier, though, Nishiyama would go on to carve out his own path at SNK, making Fatal Fury, Art of Fighting, and King of Fighters, and then in 2000, when SNK would be bought out by Aruzi, a company that decided to dismantle SNK and sell it for parts, Nishiyama would then split off and create his own company, Dimps, where he would recruit various other employees from SNK. And now that we know how Nishiyama's career began, it kind of makes his career path a bit poetic. When his former boss was forced out of Irum, he would go on to start his own gaming company and recruit Nishiyama, and then over a decade later, when Nishiyama was forced out of SNK, he would start up his own gaming company and recruit various creators from SNK. Seems Nishiyama did get that cinematic story he always wanted after all, just for himself. But back over to Capcom, Nishiyama had left the company, so Capcom decided to make a sequel to this game, which might be why things were about to change so drastically. Yeah, Capcom was very willing to try some different directions with this sequel, and they started throwing ideas out left and right. Originally, Street Fighter 2 was going to get rid of all the characters from the first game and start new with eight brand new fighters. And if you're curious about the roster that we almost ended up getting, then we did a whole video on cut Street Fighter characters. So if you want to know more info on these characters, including a prototype for Johnny Cage named Dick Jumpsy, then click the card that's popping up right now. Also, the game was going to do away with the idea of traveling around the world, and instead it was going to be set on an island where a tournament would see you traveling up the island through locations such as a cave, a bridge, a city, and eventually you would reach the top of a mountain where you would challenge the boss. However, shortly into the development, they ran into a problem. Thanks to the popularity of the Nintendo Entertainment System, there was a worldwide shortage of 1 megabyte ROM chips. You see, Street Fighter 1 used 48 megabytes, so because they were lacking these chips, they were going to have to come up with an idea for a game that would only require 32 megabytes. So with these new restrictions in place, Capcom had to abandon all their plans for this sequel. Yeah, all these character sketches wound up in the trash because they just didn't have the horsepower to make this game work. But they stuck with it. They tinkered around with some brand new ideas, and eventually they came up with a game that could work. And so the next year, Capcom began promoting the brand new Street Fighter, and that is not Street Fighter, is it? Yes, as Capcom was struggling to come up with a brand new game that could run on 32 megabytes, developer Yoshiki Okamoto had noticed a rise in beat-em-up games and was inspired by Double Dragon 2 to make one as well, with three heroes roaming the gritty urban landscape of Metro City, taking on the criminal organization known as the Mad Gear Gang. At which point, the sales division at Capcom said, Hey, we really need a new Street Fighter right now! So they decided to just call his new game Street Fighter 89 and even promoted it by saying that the protagonist Cody was, quote, a former Street Fighter. And I find this to be so fascinating because if you'll remember, Nishiyama invented the very first beat-em-up game. He created that genre. And then he created Street Fighter. Then he leaves Street Fighter, so they decide to turn Street Fighter into a beat-em-up. Doesn't it feel like all these events are out of order? Unfortunately for Capcom, this rock-solid plan of just calling whatever game they had ready the new Street Fighter had one small problem. This looked and played nothing like Street Fighter. Yeah, when showing this game off at trade shows, there was one note that they kept getting from everyone who tried it out. Why is this called Street Fighter? Everyone said this was nothing like the first game, so before releasing it, they changed the name to Final Fight, which kicked off a brand new franchise for Capcom that would be a huge hit for them in the arcade era. Now, I made sure to bring that story up for two reasons. 
One is because I just find it crazy to think that the reason this wasn't the starting roster of Street Fighter 2 is because everyone loved Mario so much that Capcom had to stop working on Street Fighter and make Final Fight instead. And two, because Final Fight was such a success that Capcom decided to keep this new franchise tied to Street Fighter, saying that both of these games existed in the same universe, with several Final Fight characters appearing in later Street Fighters. Multiple developers and artists from Final Fight were then brought on board to work on Street Fighter 2, hoping to bring some of the success of that game onto this sequel, because Capcom... Well, they thought there was something to Street Fighter, a good idea at its core, but even they knew it was rough. Yeah, every time that I talked about the gameplay of Street Fighter, I made sure to remind you guys that it was created in 1987. But even in 1987, people thought it was kind of a mess. In a 1997 interview with GamePro, Final Fight's creator Yoshiki Okamoto, who had just been brought on board to work on Street Fighter, said, quote, The basic idea at Capcom was to revive Street Fighter, a good game in concept, but to make it a better playing game. So there was a whole new team on this game, around 35 to 40 people, one of the largest staffs Capcom had ever put on a game. Many of them, in addition to Okamoto, such as the game's planners Akira Yasuda and Akira Nishitani, having come straight from Final Fight, while many other designers for the game were brand new to the industry, and this whole huge collection of new talents were being told by Capcom, okay, make this, but not this. And with so many voices being given instructions like that, it's no wonder this game went through so many different ideas during its development. They designed dozens of brand new fighters, some admittedly less memorable than others, and they even pictured incorporating hazards into each stage, something that we wouldn't see in fighting games until years later. Then at some point during development, they had the idea to put weapons around the stage for you to pick up, basically taking their experience from Final Fight and putting it directly into this game. And while many of these ideas seem wild, you can forgive them because this was a bold new territory for them. They were trying to invent this game from scratch. However, there were some ideas that you can't really forgive. For example, there's only one female character in this game, and originally, Yoshiki Okamoto had... an idea for her. According to an interview with Polygon in 2014, Okamoto said, and I can't stress enough, I'm quoting him here, quote, you know how each character has a life bar? At one point, I wanted to make the power gauge for Chun-Li shorter than the other characters because women are not as strong. Oh! Oh, Okamoto, no! No, Okamoto, no! No, 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 no. He was talked out of this idea by Nishitani, and thank God for that. Boy, I gotta tell you, over the years of doing these retrospectives and studying the development of these games, it really makes you realize how many times some of your favorite franchises came this close to being a real trash fire. And speaking of that, unlike the initial idea Capcom had back in 1988, this team decided that they did want to have one character from the previous game return. Ken. You heard me. Yes, the higher-ups at Capcom told the developers not to use Ryu. I have no idea why they were told that, maybe because, as I said, they were told to make a better version of the original Street Fighter, so they wanted to separate themselves from the protagonist of the last game, or maybe they were just bitter at Nishiyama for leaving, so they decided to scrap his poster boy. Whatever the reason may be, originally Ryu was not going to return, and instead, they were going to make Ken the protagonist, who just happened to have the same moves as Ryu, and was now being redesigned to look exactly like Ryu. But I guess eventually someone at Capcom realized, wait, this is stupid, just use Ryu, and the rest is history. And so, after 10 months of development, this ragtag team of young developers introduced to the world what is quite possibly the most famous video game sequel ever. Street Fighter 2 was released in February 1991, and right from the moment the character select screen pops up, you can tell this game was different from any other fighter. Mostly because it had a character select screen. Yeah, for anyone not familiar with the first Street Fighter, you might have been surprised when I mentioned you could only play as Ryu. But there was a reason for that. Because that's just what fighting games were back then. 
Remember, this was an almost non-existent genre back then. There weren't many examples of fighters in the 80s, so the few fighting games that did exist only let you play as one character. So when Street Fighter 2 started up and you saw a select screen with eight different characters, that was mind-blowing. There was so much variety to these characters. You had a guy shooting out fireballs, a lady jumping all over the screen, a big beefy wrestler, a beast man, a guy with stretchy arms. This cast of characters provided players with so many options that allowed them to play the game how they wanted. One of the most important things in fine games is expression. It's making a cast of characters that can speak to the widest audience out there, so that way anyone can pick up a game and say, that's my main. And this was the first fighting game to actually make people think like that. This was the first time someone actually asked another person, who do you play as? And I'm gonna go ahead and warn you guys right now, in each of our retrospectives, I like to give you a little bit of my own personal experience with these games, just a pinch here or there. But for this retrospective, I'm going to grab a whole handful of reminiscing because Street Fighter has been a very important series to me throughout my life. And I remember when I was a kid, my school went on a field trip to Skateland, USA. It was one of those end of the school year, everyone is celebrating being done with all their work kind of trips. And as we were lining up to get skates, I looked over to the arcade and I saw a brand new Street Fighter 2 cabinet. It was the first time I had ever seen this game. And I proceeded to spend the entire day not going out into the rink once and instead spend all my time and money just pumping cores into this machine over and over because the second I saw this cast of characters, heard this music, saw everything that you could do in this game, I was hooked. So let's talk a bit about this cast. You got Ryu, the prototype fighting game protagonist, a man who wanders the world with nothing but a duffel bag in his gi, looking for strong opponents to fight. Ken, a cocky all-American champ, he's the son of a wealthy businessman who trained beside Ryu as a kid and now acts as his chief rival. Chun-Li, a young woman whose police officer father was killed by a mad crime boss and is entering this tournament to hunt him down. Gao, a pilot in the Air Force, his mentor and commanding officer was also killed by this same mysterious criminal and is joining the tournament to stop him as well. Dalsim, a wise yogi from India, he's fighting to help raise money for his village. Zengif, a powerhouse wrestler from the USSR, joins this tournament to fight strong opponents because fighting literal bears isn't enough for him anymore. Edmund Honda, or E Honda for short, he's a good natured, boisterous man who wants to prove the power of sumo wrestling to the world. And lastly, the man beast Blanca. He was a young boy whose plane crashed in the Brazilian rainforest and was raised fighting wild animals and eating electric eels, causing his skin to turn green and gain electric powers. The amount of backstory each of these characters had was huge for the time, and each of them had designs and animations and fighting styles that made you want to know more about them. Who's this green guy? Why can he generate electricity? Who is this guy that can stretch his arms? What's up with the military guy with a crazy haircut? You see these characters and you instantly want to know more, while at the same time already kind of having a grasp of who they are just from their designs and actions. And the presentation on this game goes beyond just the memorable characters. The stages were great and exploding with color and life. There were cheering crowds, wild animals, exotic locations, and no two stages looked anything like each other. They were all so distinct, and again, since every character had their own unique stage, they all add to these fighters' personalities. Although I will say I do believe that Capcom owes every arcade employee of the 90s a handwritten apology letter for the elephants on Dulcim stage. Seriously, in the 90s, if you walked into an arcade, you would hear three sounds. The smacking of air hockey pads, the Daytona theme, and this. <laughs> Okay, I love this game, but even I hated those elephants as a kid. However, on the positive side of the sound design, the music in this game is top notch. The music for Street Fighter 2 was made by Isao Abe and the future legend Yoko Shimomura. And if you don't know who Yoko Shimomura is, Kind of a big freaking deal, that's who she is. Wanna know what a badass Yoko Shimomura was? The deadline to finish the theme music for Street Fighter 2 was so tight that she stayed at Capcom late one night working on it, and the security actually locked the doors and turned the lights out on her 
So she had to stay there overnight by herself to make sure the music was done by 7 a.m. the next morning. And this dedication paid off because Street Fighter 2 has some of the most memorable themes in fighting game history. Chun-Li has this active upbeat and poppy charm to it. Ryu has this rising tone that makes you feel like you're climbing your way up to stronger challenges. Guile's theme is so memorable, it kicked off a freaking meme thanks to how it goes with everything. And Ken's theme? Do I even have to tell you how much I love Ken's theme? I use it on pretty much every show on this channel. And the graphics were vastly improved. This was leagues above anything else we saw in arcades at the time. And it was loaded with colors and life. The presentation level on this game was so high, the way the characters were animated when they did certain moves, or how they celebrated when they won, the way they looked damaged after you lost as the continue screen started ticking down made you race to get the next quarter, the way the characters puked when you hit them with a heavy attack. Okay, yeah, that one might not have been the best decision. I'm glad we lost that in future games. But the presentation extended to the stages as well, as they would have breakable items around the set that you could throw your opponent into that would make it feel like you were doing damage, and also it made it feel like you were, for lack of a better term, street fighting. When Nishiyama was making the first game, he said he wanted it to feel like a fight could break out anywhere, and these destructible items on the stages really helped to sell that. Although not every decision helped the presentation, as there would also be items in the foreground which were there just to make the stage look nicer and give it some depth, which admittedly, it does do that. But it also blocks your view of the action, which, you know, is kind of important in a fighting game. But remember, this was the dawn of the genre. If you want to know how experimental things were back then and how far back we're going, this was at a time when people didn't quite realize, oh, maybe you need to see what your opponent is doing. But the biggest bump in quality and arguably the biggest draw of this game was the combat. Now, I will admit, there's still some early fighting game jank to this game. You still do tons of damage, in fact, sometimes it can seem completely random as attacks can do wildly different damage depending on when it hits. And worst of all, you get stunned when you take too much damage, leaving you wide open for more attacks, but how many hits it takes to stun you seems to be whatever the game feels like doing at that time. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure there is actually some equation the game uses to calculate when you get stunned, but I've seen characters get hit five, six times, no stun. Then another character gets hit twice, and boom, they're seeing cartoon birds. And the computer can be a bit unfair at times. For example, certain effects can be extended or shortened depending on how quickly you mash buttons. For example, how long you're stunned depends on how quickly you mash buttons to get out of it. And check how quickly the boss of the game can escape a stun. Yeah, that computer is mashing buttons faster than humanly possible to pull that off. Or worst of all, some characters have throws that can be extended depending on how quickly you and the opponent mash buttons during the throw. And if the computer is playing any of these characters and they grab you, you can just put the controller down and go make yourself a sandwich because you're going to be there for a while. But aside from those handful of issues, the gameplay was incredible. I mean, yes, as always, I'm putting the giant asterisks of for the time up there, but unlike the first Street Fighter where I had to really try hard to justify the positives in that game, Street Fighter 2 still kind of holds up. Seriously, if you've never played the original Street Fighter 2, then you can pick this game up now and it'll still feel pretty good. And that's because the combat has far more depth to it now. Each character had roughly 30 unique attacks, three basic punches and three basic kicks, but many characters had proximity normals, meaning that their basic attacks would do different actions depending on how close you were to the opponent. Then you also had different versions of each of the six basic attacks depending on whether or not you're jumping or if you're crouching. Again, I am aware that in 2023, that doesn't sound like anything special, but at the time, this basically tripled all of your options. And every character's moveset felt different. Some characters felt heavier and were slower, some were lighter and far more agile. For example, Sengif can barely jump over projectiles while Chun-Li can literally bounce off the walls. This was not the day and age of every playable character being a palette swap of each other. Every character stood out, and as I said, giving these characters such vastly different playstyles helped make them unique enough that they would speak to each individual player. Characters also had their own unique special moves. They only had about two each, and there were way too many charge characters for my liking, but this still adds to your variety. And this game even invented brand new types of moves never before seen in a fighting game. 
Up until this point, if your opponent was blocking, yeah, you could try hitting them low or you could try hitting them high, but that was about it. Those are all your options. But now, if you can't figure out a way around your opponent blocking, just press forward and heavy punch or heavy kick and you would perform an unblockable throw. That's right. Street Fighter 2 invented throw attacks. That's like hearing someone invented the chair. You kind of just assumed it was always there, but nope, someone had to be the first one to think it up. And because of this wide variety of moves and how different everyone played, it forced players to actually have to think about what they were doing. They had to think about things like, how long does this move stretch out? The opponent really doesn't let me get in on them, so if I attack from here, will this hit? If I just kind of stick my foot out, can I maybe like just poke them with that? Can I maybe just get some pokes in? The opponent keeps jumping at me. What am I supposed to do about that? Is there, is there a move I have that could possibly stop that? Like an anti-air attack? Is that a thing? Do I have an anti-air? So many of the core fundamentals about fighting games that establish everything that we know about the genre were born from this game. But there's something else very important to fighting games that Street Fighter 2 created. Did you see it? How about here? Notice anything special? Probably not, because it's not the kind of thing that you would find out of the ordinary today. It's combos. Yes, Street Fighter 2 invented fighting game combos, and by invented, I mean fell ass backwards into. Because the combo system in Street Fighter 2 was a glitch. This was not intentional. But while developing this game, the testers realized that in very specific situations, it was possible for a character to follow up one attack with another one that would be quicker than the opponent could recover from the stun animation meaning you could connect the next attack before the opponent had a chance to block in between. And some of the developers actually worried that this would ruin the game because players would get frustrated getting stunwalked by consecutive attacks. But in the end, they decided, eh, screw it, leave it in. Nobody's going to spend that much time on this game that they end up learning the exact frame data that they need to know to link moves together. I'm sure this won't end up being the foundation of this entire genre and define the future of fighting games. Much, much, much later. <laughs> Yes, everything else that I've talked about, the variety of moves, the variety of character builds, inventing new moves to handle different situations, these were all important to Street Fighter 2's gameplay. But this one glitch is what took Street Fighter from influential to being the blueprint for all future fighting games. Every time that you have ever seen a YouTube video of someone breaking down a character's frame data, a combo showcase, teaching you how to do a mother freaking infinite, it's all thanks to this glitch. This is what made fighting games go from people just seeing who could hit buttons the hardest, and in Street Fighter 1's case I mean that quite literally, to being something competitive. Something that takes timing and knowledge and precision to pull off. Something that's actually a test of people's skills. And the fact that it was put in here by accident is enough to make your mind melt just thinking about what could have happened if someone at Capcom said, Nah, take it out. Nobody wants that in there. So I think we've covered all the ins and outs of the gameplay in these characters, but there's still so much more to go over with this game. As you go through the arcade ladder, you'll see a little plane flying around the globe, which was how the stage transitions worked in the first game, but now the map was brighter. It popped out more. The sound design of the plane taking off was so much more memorable. And because of this, this map became one of the most iconic staples of Street Fighter. And again, speaking personally, I know this is going to sound really bizarre to some people, but I have to talk about it. I grew up in a very, very small town out in the country. It was that kind of place where everyone you met came from within a five mile radius of you. And when I first saw Street Fighter 2 and I saw this map and I saw all these different countries and saw this plane flying around the world and each character came from a different background, my tiny kid brain lit up. I know how stupid this sounds, but as someone who grew up in a very isolated small town, seeing this idea of people from so many different countries coming together, it meant something to me. I mean, these were places that were so far away, Japan, Brazil, India, the USSR, places that I couldn't even imagine, 
and now they had characters representing them who I could play as and fight alongside, it brought a piece of the world to my fingertips in a way that even the Olympics didn't do. And they called these fighters the World Warriors, and just that name alone, World Warriors, it created this idea of unity, this idea of everyone having a hero that they could play as. And to this day, I think one of the greatest things about fighting games, and one of the biggest appeals of fighting games, is a diverse cast. I think that fighting games should provide a cast that represents a wide range of people from different backgrounds and different lives, and it was Street Fighter 2 that made me believe that. And I am well aware of how strange it might sound to say that I feel this way because of a game with a green monkey man and a stretchy guy who says yoga over and over. And now that I'm an adult, I also realize how problematic many of these representations are, and I'm not going to pretend like they aren't. But again, I was a kid in 1991. This was a pretty big deal for me back then. Now after every three fights, you get a bonus stage again, but just like the combat, these were vastly improved from the first game. In Street Fighter 1, whether or not you actually broke those bricks or chopped those boards felt like it was completely up to chance. You can hit that button three times in a row, and maybe it'll work once? But now, you had to beat up a car, which tested how quickly you could output damage. Then you had to destroy barrels as they were falling from the sky, which tested your maneuverability. And you had to tear down a tower of burning oil drums, which honestly doesn't really test anything, and is the easiest challenge out of all of them, and I'm willing to bet they just threw it in there at the end because they realized they needed one more and this was due tomorrow. But beating up the car and breaking these barrels would go on to become two iconic features for this series and would appear in multiple future Street Fighters. But if we're talking about things in the arcade ladder that you might not expect to leave a huge impact on these games, let's talk about the win quotes. Yes, after each fight, the winner now had a message for the opponent, and unlike the first game, they were actually unique. For example, Chun-Li refers to herself as the world's strongest woman, Ken taunts the opponent and threatens to crush them. These aren't anything special, but they do give you some more, say it with me everyone, personality to these characters. Although, when it comes to these win quotes, there are two that stand out. Not because of how good or bad they are, but because of the screwed up backstory behind them. I'm sure everyone out there has seen the meme of the Super Nintendo version of this game where Gao tells Chun-Li to go home and be a family man. Well, in Japan, the actual win quote is, go home. I'm sure you have a family too. Yeah, that sounds more like Gao, telling someone to go home and stop risking their life because they've probably got someone back home that cares about them. That's a good win quote for someone who's trying to take down this evil supervillain because he lost someone important to him, and it adds some irony to the fact that Gao became so focused on revenge that he ended up ignoring his own family as well. Unfortunately, because English is a longer language than Japanese, they couldn't fit all that text on screen after translating it, so they decided to go with the best possible option. And I guess this was the best possible option. But that is a tiny footnote in the weird history of Street Fighter when it comes to the next win quote. Most of you know where I'm going with this, and some of you are about to go on a ride. When Ryu beats you, he says, you must defeat Shin Long to stand a chance. Wait, what? Hold up, Shin Long? Who's Shin Long? What is Shin Long? Is that some secret character? Are they a part of the game's lore? Who is this mysterious man that Ryu keeps talking about? Well, to put it simply, Shin Long is nobody because they don't exist because this is a mistranslation. In Japanese, Ryu says, you must defeat my Shoryuken to stand a chance. Shoryuken, as we already discussed, is Ryu's rising punch. But Shoryuken roughly translates into Dragon Punch. But you see, Street Fighter 2 wasn't translated from Japanese to English. No, it was translated from Japanese to Chinese and then to English. And in Chinese, Shoryuken was translated to Xinglong Punch, which roughly means Dragon Spirit Punch. And the Chinese translators at Capcom USA had no idea what Shin Long was, so they just assumed that was something in the story, and they decided to leave it in. Oh, okay, so it was all just a misunderstanding. That's no big deal. Case closed then. Oh, 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 no the hell it is not. Case jammed wide open, in fact. Case banging at your front door, demanding to be let in. Street Fighter 2 became so big that people wanted to know more about these world warriors, and if you dangled the carrot of possible lore in front of their face, they were going to chomp at it. And seeing these waves of arcade junkies asking for answers, Electronic Gaming Monthly decided to give it to them, even if they were going to make it up as they went along. In April of 1992, they put out an article saying that they had discovered who Shing Long was. He was apparently a secret fight, and to face him, you would have to use Ryu. 
then go through the entire arcade ladder without getting hit once. Then you would have to face the final boss and neither of you would have to hit each other for 10 rounds, leading to 10 draw games in a row. Then after the 10th draw match, Xing Long would appear, toss the boss aside, and you would then be forced to fight this legendary opponent. Xing Long was so powerful that he had the fastest fireballs in the game. He had a spin kick like Chun-Li, but stronger. His fist caught on fire when he did the Shoryuken, and he could even grab you in the air. This was obviously an April Fool's Day joke, and nobody was ever going to think this was serious. People actually thought this was serious. Everyone, and I mean everyone, was talking about this. I remember being a kid in school, hearing people say, no man, he's real. I saw it in a magazine. You can't just make up fake images and then say they're real. So Capcom got in front of this and they corrected the mistranslation for the Super Nintendo port of Street Fighter and had Ryu say you must defeat his Dragon Punch, only to then refer to Shin Long as Ryu and Ken's master in the instruction manual. Which means that this one-off joke was now slowly actually influencing the actual lore of the games. Now, of course, as anyone who has played later games can tell you, Shing Long did not remain the name of Ryu and Ken's master, and they eventually did change it to Goken. But there were multiple other tiny details from this April Fool's Day article that would go on to influence the future of Street Fighter, and we'll talk about some of those a little bit later in this video. But for now, let's wrap up this journey through the original Street Fighter 2. As I said, you'll travel around the world taking on each of these fighters until there's nobody left and you're crowned the champion is what you would think, but nope, as soon as you finish fighting the final opponent, three mid-bosses appear. Balrog, Vega, and the returning Sagat. First up is Balrog, an American boxer who was banned from the professional circuit thanks to his dirty playstyle. Then there's Vega, a crazed serial killer obsessed with beauty. He's constantly jumping around the stage, making him one of the hardest enemies to hit, and he will even jump on the cage in the background of his stage to launch an aerial attack. I think every kid from the early 90s has that one shared memory of the first time they were facing Vega and they suddenly saw him jump on the cage behind them and they just had that minor freak out because they had no idea what he was doing. No other character could interact with the stage, why is he able to do it? Then Sagat returns, but now he has a big scar on his chest. This is one of the first instances of lore and world building being put into the game as this scar was given to him by Ryu after the last game. Apparently, during the final match, Ryu was overcome with some dark force that caused him to strike Sagat with a powerful Shoryuken that left this scar across his chest. And so, Sagat became obsessed with getting his revenge, and he joined this group of villains, and apparently learned how to be a scummy troll in the process because he spends the whole match launching projectiles at you, and if you try and jump over them, he will then instantly hit you with a tiger uppercut. The only sound more irritating in this game than hearing Dawson's elephants is just hearing Sagat go, Tiger, Tiger, Tiger. Tiger, 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 Tiger. Over and over again. But that's nothing compared to the true villain of the game, the final boss, M. Bison. He's the head of a criminal organization called Shadowloo. In the first game, Shadowloo and M. Bison's goals were mysterious, but as the series went on, we learned that Bison's true plan was world domination, and he had to seek out strong fighters to help enhance his own psycho powers, or to brainwash them into serving him as either his soldiers or as a new body for him to put his powers into as a form of reincarnating himself. But even if we didn't get any of that in the first game, we still knew he was evil because holy crap, this is probably the earliest instance of a broken final boss. He's got flip kicks that hit you from different angles, he's got a jumping stomp that can hit you even when you're crouching, a full screen charge that can hit you multiple times, doing major damage even if you block. M. Bison was one of the earliest video game bullies, designed specifically to take your quarters. But he wasn't impossible. You could learn his moves, and you could learn to fight back, and it made beating him an obtainable yet still very rewardable goal. Now before we wrap this up, now that we've covered all the bosses, there is one big footnote that we have to cover about them that has left people confused when talking about this game for years. Balrog, Vega, Sagat, and M. Bison form the four faces of Shadowloo, the four emperors they're called. And Sagat, hey, we all know Sagat, the former world champ, disgraced by Ryu, wants revenge, nothing more to say. But Balrog, Vega, and M. Bison all have one problem, and that's that depending on where in the world you come from, you just pictured completely different characters when I said those names. You see, in Japan, Balrog was called M. Bison, Vega was called Balrog, and M. Bison was called Vega. 
Now, why exactly would they change those names for Western audiences? Well, because in English, the M in M. Bison has never been explained, but it's implied that stands for mighty, and it's just a grandiose title that Bison gave himself. But in Japan, the M stands for Mike, making this guy... Mike Bison. Get it? Yes, Balrog was based not that loosely on Mike Tyson, and for Capcom USA, the name Mike Bison combined with a portrait that was one haircut away from being a straight-up photo of the champ got a little too close to being an uncomfortable phone call from their lawyer for them. Back in those days, Capcom USA was very nervous about legal issues, hence why they did things like rename Biohazard to Resident Evil in the West. So they decided to swap two characters' names is what I would say if this game didn't want to get even more confusing. No, they decided to swap all three character names. Why all three, when you really only need to change two? Well, I haven't been able to find any interviews saying this, so take this next part with the biggest grain of salt, but the rumor is that when they decided to change M. Bison's name, they were either going to give it to Vega or Balrog. But then they realized that Balrog is from Spain, and Vega is a Spanish surname. So they decided while they were changing names around, why not give the Spanish name to the guy from Spain? Then just move everything one step over. So that's why if you see this game in Japan, you might be confused why characters' names are different. And it's also why within the universe of Street Fighter, Balrog's nickname is the Crazy Buffalo, because it plays into the fact that his name is actually Bison. And I'll just go ahead and clarify this right now. For the remainder of this retrospective, seeing as how this video is in English, I am going to be using the English names for these characters. But if you find this confusing, don't worry, you're not alone. That's why Street Fighter fans just refer to these three characters by their nicknames, Boxer, Claw, and Dictator. So if you're ever watching a Street Fighter tournament and wondering why the announcer is referring to someone as Dictator, that's why. Also going to address this right now, I've heard several people over the years say that Balrog was in Street Fighter 1 because his Japanese name is Mike, and there is an American boxer in the first game also named Mike. But no, Capcom has confirmed this multiple times, these are not the same character. Heck, in Street Fighter 5, they create arcade ladders based around every single one of the previous Street Fighters, and if you play through the Street Fighter 1 arcade as Balrog, then he has a nightmare where he dreams that reporters think Mike is him, confirming once and for all that no, Mike is not Balrog. So, back to the game. After you defeat Bison, each character gets their ending. Gal returns to his family, realizing just how long he's been gone on his quest for revenge. Dawson returns to his village. Honda returns to train his sumo students. Blanca is reunited with his mother and realizes that he is a normal boy, not an ape man. Chun-Li tells his father's grave that she avenged him and she decides to go back to being a young single girl. Zangief dances alongside Mikhail Gorbachev, and just speaking as someone who grew up as a kid in the 80s, that was a very weird thing to suddenly see a real-world politician inside his video game. Ken is reunited with his girlfriend Eliza, who... really shows that they did not have much time left to polish this game in those final few weeks. They had to get this thing out the door, even if some characters had to be turned into stick puppets. And Ryu is nowhere to be found. He's already left and on the road again, already seeking the next battle. Ceremony means nothing to him. The fight is all. And that is how Street Fighter 2 comes to an end. For now, at least, because this game blew up bigger than anything Capcom had ever done. Heck, the SNES port of this game alone would go on to be Capcom's highest selling game until Resident Evil 4 surpassed it in 2005. That means that for 14 years, this one port, I repeat, just the Super Nintendo version of this game remained the undisputed king of Capcom games, and every version of Street Fighter 2 combined is estimated to have sold nearly 21 million copies. Again, that is combining the sales of every version of this game, and as I have said, there are a lot of ports and updates of this game, but still, that is an achievement that is next to impossible to top. So that means it's time to talk about the impact that Street Fighter 2 had, and the biggest impact that Street Fighter 2 had on fighting games is that created fighting games. Yes, there were fighters before Street Fighter 2, there were fighters before Street Fighter 1, I've already mentioned a few of them. But the fighting game genre back then was still this amorphous blob just floating in a void. Street Fighter 2 is the game that gave it a shape and made everyone say, oh, this. And that combined with the unstoppable success of the arcade cabinets gave rise to the fighting game boom. 
Street Fighter 2 became one of the biggest arcade successes ever. Over the course of its life and the life of its eventual re-releases, it would become the third highest grossing arcade game ever behind Space Invaders and Pac-Man. And if the only two games to sell more than you are Space Invaders and Pac-Man, you're doing pretty well. So when everyone from local restaurants to grocery stores to laundromats were putting Street Fighter machines under their roofs, it meant everyone else wanted to get a slice of that pie. So for the next several years, fighting games started to flood the market. It became the dominant genre of the early 90s. Heck, just speaking personally, it became so huge, it's what made me understand what a genre was. Seeing so many fighting games all coming out together was the first time my little child brain said, Hey, wait a second. This isn't Mario. These games are all similar to each other, but different from other games. Again, I realized I was just a child at the time, so this wasn't some big, massive eureka moment for the entire population as a whole, but the fact that there were so many of these games coming out that they could actually make a kid realize the concept of genres is kind of impressive. And you might be thinking, okay, so there were a lot of fighting games at the time. That makes sense, but was it really that big? You have no idea. I say this with no inkling of doubt in my mind, I have never seen another genre boom quite like the fighting game boom. Sure, there have been other impressive booms, like when Halo struck it big and everyone wanted to make first-person shooters, but that wasn't even close to this. Or there was when Fortnite blew up and everyone wanted to make battle royales, but even at the height of that craze, we were getting maybe one new battle royale a month. At the height of the fighting game boom, we were getting a brand new game almost every single week. Big studios like Nintendo and Sega wanted to make fighting games. Every licensed property needed a fighting game. Even games that were originally planned to be completely different genres had to have their production halted so they could turn them into fighting games. And many of these games explode in popularity, like Mortal Kombat, which then proceeded to spread out and start their own ripoff games. Fighting games became a whole multiverse, and Street Fighter was Earth Prime. It caused other games to be created, and then those other games caused other games to be created, and it just kept going and going. And you might not think it was all that big, because you're trying to think of all the big games that came out afterwards, all the big titles that started in the early 90s. But no, 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 no. If you want to know the full extent of the fighting game boom, you can't just think of the winners. You don't even know how many flops just popped up because people were that desperate to get a piece of Street Fighter Mania. It wasn't just Mortal Kombat and King of Fighters and Virtual Fighter. No, no, no. I'm talking about stuff like Best of Best, Super Fighter, Time Killers, I Could Keep Going, and I Will, Rise of Robots, Angel Eyes, Pretty Fighter, Jackie Chan Fist of Fire. Okay, seriously, I'll stop now. My point is, if you think it's an exaggeration to say that Street Fighter 2 changed the face of video games and largely defined the arcade scene throughout the 90s, I assure you it is not. So yeah, fighting game fever was sweeping the nation and everyone wanted to make the next Street Fighter 2. Including Street Fighter 2. Okay, I've danced around this up until now, but time to finally talk about Street Fighter 2 might be the most re-released game in history. Not just because Capcom keeps putting out ports of the original game, but because they kept making brand new versions of the game. Over and over and over again. Capcom actually put out a brand new version of Street Fighter 2 in 2017, one year after Street Fighter 5 came out. So let's take a quick look at these versions to see what makes them different. The first re-release came out the next year in March of 1992. This was Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition, or Street Fighter 2 Dash as it was called in Japan. Now, what was the development like behind the scenes of this game? Well, Capcom decided they really liked money, so they decided to put out a new version. Yeah, for the rest of this video, there aren't a whole lot of crazy backstories left for these games. It was pretty much just, we decided to try this, and then they did. With a few exceptions, as you will see coming up. So, since we don't have to worry about any of that, let's talk about what made this game different. Well, there were a few visual improvements. The character portraits looked nicer, Ken's wife Eliza no longer looked like she was cut out of construction paper, and Ryu and Ken no longer look like they're trying to fit an invisible sandwich in their mouth when they smile. And as for the combat, there were several tweaks made to try and make the game more balanced and try and make it a better competitive experience. For example, damage was scaled down and it felt far more stable. Moves tended to do the same damage every single time, rather than changing drastically depending on when and how they hit. 
Also, you could still get stunned from too much damage, but it didn't happen as often. You could now go an entire round without someone getting dizzy. But the big addition to this version is that now all four of the bosses were playable, including M. Bison, who ended up starting the trend of unlockable boss characters being way overpowered. Look at how much damage he does to the opponent when they block his Psycho Crusher. That was chip damage. At that point, you might as well just take the hit. So yes, this game now jumped from 8 to 12 playable characters, although unfortunately the four emperors all share the same victory screen. When you beat the arcade mode with one of them, you get treated to the exact same image of them standing over their armies emerging from flames, although their faces are rearranged based on who won, and the text scrolling through is different for each fighter. In fact, speaking of that, I have to bring this up. If Balrog wins, he says he cheers to the crowd because he wanted to prove to all of them that the American dream is still real. I'm going to guess that the translators wrote that before they saw it would be going on top of something that looked like it came from the opening sequence of a Terminator film. Now, as for the success of Champion Edition, you might think that people wouldn't have spent a lot of money on it because it was just an update to the game that most arcades already owned. And you would be wrong, because the hype for Street Fighter was still so high at this point that according to Replay Magazine, Champion Edition ended up becoming the highest grossing arcade game of 1992 which was all Capcom needed to hear to keep this train rolling. In December of that very same year, yeah, I told you they were pumping these things out like crazy, Capcom would release Street Fighter II Hyper Fighting, or Street Fighter II Turbo as it was called in Japan. And Turbo is correct, because while this game didn't feature any new characters, although it did change everyone's colors around to make them feel like new characters, almost all the adjustments for this game were in the gameplay. Each character got brand new moves, including some of their most iconic abilities, but the biggest change to the game was the pacing. Hyper fighting amps up the speed dramatically. You can end a special move and then launch into your next move almost immediately. And every character is so agile they can all jump around like Vega did, meaning Vega himself has now become a living nightmare. But why did Capcom decide to increase the speed so drastically? Well, there's a pretty interesting reason for that. As I said earlier, everyone wanted to make their own version of Street Fighter back in the day. Including hackers. Yes, a hacked version of Street Fighter started making its way through arcades in 1992 called Street Fighter Rainbow Edition. Now, I want everyone to realize what a big deal this was. This wasn't a mod that someone made that you could just go online and find with a quick Google search and then download. No, this was an actual physical edition that someone had to install onto an arcade cabinet and yet it caught on purely by word of mouth to the point where this version of Street Fighter was popping up in arcades all over America. An achievement like that was insane to think of and eventually word of the Rainbow Edition reached Capcom themselves. So they contacted James Goddard, one of the heads of R&D at Capcom USA, and they told him to go to Galaxy Arcade in San Jose, California, where he did indeed find the bootleg version of Street Fighter 2. He played it for several hours, and what he found was Ryu throwing out curving Hadoukens in the air, projectiles launching out whenever you did an uppercut, but none of that really impressed him. No, what won him over was the speed. Rainbow Edition was much faster than the regular version of Street Fighter 2, and after experiencing it for a few hours, he couldn't go back. In a Polygon article from 2014, Goddard said, quote, I come back and I spend the next few hours writing a letter to Japan saying Rainbow Edition is utter sh**. Utter garbage. There is no threat here. It is completely unbalanced and it's a fad. Because as a player, emotionally, that's how I felt. However, before I sent that fax out, I went to the cafeteria to play Champ Edition. I sit down to play against my co-worker Joel Pambid, and the weirdest thing happens. He picks Guile, I pick Zangief, I go to play, and oh my god, the game felt like it was underwater. I had just spent the last 4 to 6 hours playing Rainbow Edition at 25% speed increase, so Champ Edition felt like shit. It was so slow. So Goddard threw out the letter that he was about to fax to Capcom, and instead he reported this back to them, and after hearing this, Capcom decided that with their next installment, they were going to try and beat these hackers at their own game. And so Street Fighter Super Sugar Rush Edition was born. Now, as for the success of Hyper Fighting, I'd assume it would be harder to gauge this because unlike the last two games, Hyper Fighting wasn't a brand new cabinet. 
Yeah, Capcom realized store owners probably wouldn't want to buy a brand new machine in the same year they just bought the last one, so this was an update that they could then add onto the Champion Edition machines. So sales numbers might admittedly be hard to figure out, but according to Game Machine Magazine, Hyper Fighting became the highest grossing arcade machine in Japan in 1993. Three years in a row, this game was coming in number one. Even with dozens of new games coming out every year at this point, people were still flocking to Street Fighter. And so Capcom decided it might be time to make the game bigger, flashier, and give players something new. So Super Street Fighter 2 The New Challengers, or just Super Street Fighter 2 in Japan, was released in October of 1993. And this one is going to require some discussion because it saw a hefty change on several fronts. For starters, visually speaking, the game looked far better, and there's a reason for that. The first three versions of Street Fighter 2 ran on the Capcom Power System, abbreviated as the CP System. But starting with the new challengers, they would bump things up to the CP System too. And you know it's better because there's a big number 2 in there. Yes, the processing power of the CP2 was much higher than the CP1, and while there were several sprites that they kept from the previous version just to make the game easier to develop, several elements such as the projectiles saw huge bumps in quality. Just look at Chun-Li's fireball in Hyper Fighting, and now look at it in New Challengers. One of those looks like it was lovingly crafted one pixel at a time, one of those looks like it was doodled on a cocktail napkin. And because of this, while the game didn't feature any new moves per se, many of the existing moves had new qualities thanks to the advancements in the hardware. For example, every now and again when doing a Hadouken with Ryu, the fireball would come out bright orange and it would actually burn the opponent. And when it comes to Ken, when he did a Shoryuken with his heavy attack, his fist would be on fire and it would also set the enemy ablaze. Which was another small step towards separating Ken and Ryu and making them more unique characters from each other. But uh, the important thing is... That line about Ken's fist being covered in flames when he did his Shoryuken, does that, does that maybe sound familiar to any of you? Maybe like something that we brought up earlier? Yep, the legacy of Xing Long strikes again. That April Fool's article said that Xing Long would be able to light his fist on fire when he did his Shoryuken, and while the rest of the world was reading that and debating whether or not it was real, Capcom was pulling out a pen and paper and writing down fist on fire. Yep, just going to tuck that away for later. I have to state this again because it bears repeating. An April Fool's joke actually ended up influencing the future development of the game it was making a joke about. And the crazy thing is, that's not the only time that's going to happen, but we'll get back to that later. Also, while I'm talking about Ken, I know this is going to be a super awkward segue, but it's probably the only chance I'm going to get to bring this up. Street Fighter 2 blew up so much in the 90s that Hasbro jumped to get the rights to make action figures for all of these characters, and there is indeed a crazy story behind the development of these toys, and that spins off into about two or three other crazy stories, but I'm going to save that for part four when we talk about the Street Fighter spinoffs and everything outside of the games. However, the reason I am bringing this up is because around this time, Ken went from simply being Ken to being Ken Master. So why did they suddenly decide to give him a last name? Especially when many other characters in this game were still just rocking the one name? It's because Hasbro worried that if they put out a figure of a blonde guy named Ken, then many people might confuse it for the little plastic Ryan Gosling that their competitors Mattel were selling. So Hasbro invented the name Masters for Ken, and Capcom just shrugged and said, sure, whatever, and decided to make it canon. Now, I have no idea where they got the name Masters from, but I do have to say, I love this name for Ken, because even though I know this is 100% a coincidence, Ken was one of the few characters created by Nishiyama in the first game. And what was the game Nishiyama made that gave him the idea for Street Fighter? Kung Fu Masters. Again, it's 1000% a coincidence, nobody at Hasbro was doing their research to find out what eventually led to the creation of Street Fighter, but I do kind of love that in a roundabout way, this name serves as a callback to Street Fighter's inspiration. Now, while we're talking about the visual enhancements, there were several other changes made to make the game look better. You would now have messages pop up on screen to essentially tell you when you did something cool and tell you how many points that got you. If you get the first attack, score a reversal attack, or connect a combo together, then the game will tell you and then it will reward you with points so that way you can continue to chase that sweet, sweet high score. But aside from these slight visual enhancements, the gameplay didn't get many new additions. In fact, it actually lost kind of a lot. 
Hyperfine took the combat and supercharged it, making it an incredibly fast-paced, high-stakes game. And new challengers decided to slow it all the way back down again. It's now closer to the speed of the base Street Fighter 2 and Champion Edition, although it is worth noting that you can change the speed on the title screen, but most gamers didn't want to do that. They wanted the faster gameplay by default. However, there was one new addition to new challengers that did get people excited and probably helped sell a couple more cabinets. This game introduced tournament battles. This was a mode where if you had four arcade machines all connected together, you could actually run a tournament against other players. For an arcade game at this time, this was nuts, and it did show that Capcom realized the importance of a competitive scene in this growing genre. So, for anyone keeping track at home, Street Fighter 2 invented fighting games with more than one character, throws, combos, and now tournament modes. But let's get into what's really important about this game, the titular new challengers. Four brand new characters were added to this game, some of them going on to be giant names for the series. From Hong Kong, there was Fei Long, an action movie star who was very clearly meant to be a tribute to Bruce Lee. Fei Long's most notable move was a series of three hits that you could chain together by repeating the move three times. This was called the Rekuken, and just like the Hadouken or the Shoryuken and so many other moves, this would go on to inspire a whole type of move in fighting games. From this point on, any special that you could chain multiple hits together by doing multiple inputs was referred to as a Reka move. Then from Mexico, indigenous grappler T-Hawk joins the tournament to find M. Bison and make him pay after Shadaloo forced his people off their land and even killed many of his tribe. He's very notable for his mighty grabs and for his rising and diving attacks. Then there's Kami, who I'd argue is easily one of the top five faces of this series. She's a massive standout star for Street Fighter. She's got spinning kicks and leaping backhand attacks that dodge projectiles, all of which are great for getting in close on your opponent. As for her lore, Kami was a member of a special British military unit called Delta Red, but Bison kidnapped her and she ended up losing a giant chunk of her memories, and now she was out to get answers. And lastly, from Jamaica, there's DJ. He's an upbeat, positive music sensation who's entering this tournament to find a fresh new sound, and he's one of about six or seven different characters in this roster who fight with charge attacks. Now, DJ's creation has an interesting backstory, because he was the only character in all of Street Fighter 2 created by someone from Capcom USA rather than Capcom's home office. This is because when Capcom was getting the four new characters ready, they sent the early designs over to James Goddard. Yeah, remember him? And when he looked at them, he saw Kami, T-Hawk, Fei Long, and another Fei Long. Originally, the fourth new challenger was going to be Fei Long's twin brother, who would have the same body as him, but a different face meaning they would also have similar moves as well, and James Goddard said, uh, guys, we kind of already have that. Ken and Ryu? Remember? The guys who started this entire series? Yeah, that already exists in this game. So that convinced Capcom to let him come with a new character. And Goddard had just seen Billy Blanks in King of Kickboxing, and this gave him an idea. According to a 2009 interview with GameSpy, Goddard said that he wanted this game to have, quote, a really kick-ass black character, instead of someone who was more negative, which is what you tended to see from Japanese developers back in those days. So Goddard sketched up an idea for DJ, and he sent it and a VHS copy of King of Kickboxing to the Capcom office in Japan. And remember, this was back in the 90s. He had to send this by snail mail. Imagine your boss is getting in touch with you and asking for your feedback on something and then they had to wait a couple weeks on that because you had to FedEx a VHS tape to them, and then you had to wait a couple more weeks to get their feedback on your feedback. Game design in the 90s had to be a level of frustration that I can't even comprehend. Well, eventually he did hear back from them, and while they did approve of this new character, they sent back their own design, and it had DJ looking aggressive and mean. Which, in all fairness, the reference Goddard sent them was King of Kickboxing, a film where Billy Blanks is the villain, so maybe it wasn't the best source material. But Goddard said that he wanted DJ to be a source of positivity, so he drew up another sketch for them with the biggest smile he could possibly fit on DJ's face. And Capcom accepted this design and made sure that DJ was always depicted with a big smile and a big thumbs up. So that's how we got these four new characters, and I enjoy each of them, although I will say Kami is easily the standout star of the four, but just like the other characters, all four of them got their own unique themes and stages, with Fei Long and Kami stages being exceptional standouts. These sets are gorgeous. The Aurora Borealis and the stretching background in Kami's, it really shows off what the CP2 processor was capable of. By the way, speaking of these stages, I'm going to give a quick shout out here. If you enjoy deep dives into fighting games and want to learn more about these stages, 
Check out Bay Ruthless. She's a YouTuber who specializes in doing in-depth looks at fighting game stages, and she's currently going through all the Street Fighter 2 stages. It's really good stuff, and she really does her homework. I'll leave a link to where you can find those videos in the card popping up right now and the description down below. In fact, I'll let you know right now, there are so many things that I could talk about with Street Fighter. There's so many great little corners of this franchise that have their own little bits of lore and backstory to them, but there's no way that I could cover it all myself. Luckily, tons of other YouTubers out there have done deep dives into these specific little corners of this franchise. So throughout these four episodes, I'm going to be linking to many of these creators. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, then make sure to go and support those creators and check out their videos. Now, as you'd imagine, each character also got their own endings, but so did the four emperors. They finally got to show off some more personality for these characters rather than just posing for the World's Worst Queen's cover band album. For example, Balrog now takes his prize money and goes to celebrate, surrounding himself by women in gold, which is the first time that his greedy, money-grubbing side was shown off in these games, and his obsession with his fight money would become a major part of his character after this point. And one of the biggest changes that they made to the older character's endings, Chun-Li now lets you pick two options in her ending. Either she goes back to being a young single girl, or she goes back to being a cop. Although, whichever ending you pick, it always results in her just beating people up, which makes her feel a little bit more serious, and that kind of matches the tone that they gave her in later games. But as for the four new characters, T-Hawk gets his revenge on Bison for his tribe, DJ finds that new sound that he's been looking for, and he plays it on the radio for the most 90s kids you've ever seen. I hope those kids get home quick, I hear zombies ate their neighbors. Then Fei Long is offered a big movie deal, and he refuses because he says that there will never be another legend like, quote, the Great One and his son. Which is very clearly referring to Bruce Lee and Brandon Lee, who actually passed away just a few months before this game came out. Which makes this maybe the only time in fighting game history that a Bruce Lee parody character actually acknowledges that Bruce Lee exists. And then there's Cammy's ending, and yikes, this ending. Cammy confronts M. Bison and demands that he tell her what happened when she lost her memory. What did he do to her? He then says that he didn't do anything to her and he would never hurt her. Because he loved her. She lost her memory because of an accident, but before that, they were an item and they were deeply in love with each other. And upon hearing that she and Bison used to be romantically involved, Cammy doesn't take it very well. No! Everything is lies. Everything! And neither did anyone else. Yeah, this ending was retconned almost immediately. After Street Fighter 2, Capcom sank the Cammy Bison ship as fast as they could, realizing just how creepy it was considering that Cammy was a brainwashed soldier for him. So yeah, feel free to ignore this ending and never mention it again. Now when it comes to the success of new challengers, well, things start to turn around on this one. In fact, this is one of the most forgotten versions of Street Fighter 2. Despite adding four brand new characters, despite getting a major graphical overhaul, despite selling the home version with a brand new type of controller that tried to replicate the feel of the arcade buttons. Okay, that one didn't impact anything, I just wanted to bring that up because I think it means that Capcom might have invented the fight stick? So, yeah, add that one onto the pile of things that SF2 created. But despite all the advancements that this game made, the previous games had each been number one at the arcade the year they came out, or the next year if they came out late in the year. So this game came out in October of 1993, so by that logic, it should have been number one at the arcade in 1994. Instead, it was the sixth most successful game in the arcades. So what gives? Was Street Fighter Fever starting to die down? Were there just too many other fighting games out there? Was the arcade scene just slowly beginning to die? Nope, it's because Capcom released the next version of Street Fighter literally just four months later. Yeah, New Challengers is one of the most forgotten versions of Street Fighter because it was buried by a much better version of the game almost immediately. If you were somebody like me who lived way out in the country and you only got to go to an arcade like once every couple of months, you might go there, see this version of the game, go back again in a few months, and it would never be seen again. It had immediately been erased from existence. Although luckily, now in its place was...
Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, or Super Street Fighter 2 X Grandmaster Challenge in Japan, was released in February of 1994, again, just four months after the previous version. This was starting to get nuts. And it is shocking that they got out that quick, because this almost plays like a completely different game. The speed is once again bumped way up. It's back to how it was in Hyper Fighting. Yeah, most of the critiques of the last game were from people who didn't like that went back to the slower pace. Capcom thought, oh, this is way too fast. It feels crazy at times. And everyone else was like, no, we like the crazy. It's good crazy. More good crazy, please. And more good crazy is what we got because not only was the speed cranked up to 11 again, but you could also set the speed to four different settings, making it one of the wildest, fastest games on the market at the time. And each character had brand new moves. And I don't just mean special moves. They got brand new regular moves many of them being command normals that made basic buttons do different attacks depending on what direction you were pressing. Like, Ryu now got his famous solar plexus punch in this game, which is something that he has kept in pretty much every single game since. And I can say similar things for each of the characters. If you've mostly played the later Street Fighters, this is the game where they started to feel like how you come to know them. And you'll also notice a brand new addition right down there at the bottom of the screen. You see, at this point, several other fighting games add super moves, big, flashy, extra powerful moves that required some kind of a meter. So Street Fighter decided to throw in super combos to give every character their own unique super that was basically just a stronger version of one of their specials. And I mentioned that other fighting games had already introduced super moves, so this was probably included so that way Street Fighter could compete with them. And that's kind of what Super Turbo feels like to me. The previous Street Fighters were all good, but despite so many other fighting games coming out, Capcom was still holding it down at the top. But now, so many other games were starting to polish themselves. They were starting to really advance what they could do, come up with cool new mechanics, establish themselves as something unique. And because of that, I feel like Super Turbo was the game where Capcom said, okay, we actually have to compete. We have to put everything that we have into this one final version of the game. And it worked. This is indeed Capcom's A game, as almost everyone universally considers this to be the best Street Fighter II arcade game. The combat feels smoother and quicker, with far more options for each character leading to more freedom and creativity. It looks better, it feels better. This is the ultimate version of Street Fighter 2 to play against other people. If you want to challenge your friends, then you guys can pump in quarters all day long. In fact, this game still sees tournament play to this day, and I don't mean because if you scour FGC Twitter long enough, you'll find that every game still sees tournament play somewhere. No, I mean almost every major tournament out there still has Super Turbo matches going. This game blew up and still has combat that is considered impressive nearly 30 years later. It's that good. But it does have one massive glaring problem with it. You notice how all those compliments I just gave this game were centered around playing against other people? That's because if you want to just pick up some controllers with your friends, this game is amazing. But if you want to take on the arcade ladder, this game is a nightmare. And that's because Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo is broken. And just like Street Fighter 1, I don't mean broken as in unfair. No, I mean the English version of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo is literally broken. You see, back in the day, you might not have thought that arcade games had difficulty settings. That was something only for the home console, right? Nope, some arcade games did have different difficulty settings that would have to be changed in a specific way. But the English version of Super Turbo had a bug that made it so it was always set to max difficulty. The Japanese version of the game runs just fine, no bugs there, which is one of the reasons why when you see Super Turbo tournaments today, it's always the Japanese version, because typically those games are being emulated, and nobody in their right mind would emulate the English version of this game. Nobody except for Capcom, that is. Yes, to this day, whenever Capcom has re-released Super Turbo, it's always been an arcade perfect port, meaning it's the broken version. That Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection I mentioned earlier? An amazing collection of all these classic games. Super Turbo is broken. Capcom Arcade Stadium, a wonderful way of playing these legendary classics. Super Turbo is broken. The arcade room that you can play in in the lobby of Street Fighter 6, a really cool idea to bring in players to these older games. Super Turbo is broken. So if you are going to play this game, try and play the Japanese version, or, there are a few other options, but we'll get back to that later. 
So yes, the arcade mode in the American version is broken. It reads your inputs perfectly. It responds with expert timing. It instantly breaks out of stun. And remember how I mentioned some throws would go on longer if the opponent hit buttons faster than you? This is what throws in Super Turbo looks like with the difficulty bug. You ever lose over half your life to one throw before? It's the kind of thing you remember. So yeah, play Super Turbo against your friends, play it at tournaments, play it against any other living human being who wants to play you. The game is great. Do not play it against the computer. But luckily, aside from one extra bonus drawing for each character that shows what they're doing after the tournament, there isn't any real reason to play the arcade ladder. There's nothing else here really worth talking about. Oh right, him. Yes, this is Akuma, the ultimate big baddie of Street Fighter. He was the brother to Ryu and Ken's master, but he began longing to get stronger until he was overcome with an evil force known as the Satsui no Hado, which translates to Surge of Murderous Intent. He then killed Ken and Ryu's master, and he spent the rest of his life traveling the world only looking for strong opponents. And as you can tell from his arrival, he was created directly in response to that EGM April Fool's article. Yes, when I said that rumor about Shing Long spread like crazy, I wasn't kidding. It was so popular, even Capcom heard it and said, wait, a secret boss fight that begins with them coming in and taking out Bison? That's the coolest thing I've ever heard. And it's also ours now. It's in our game. We own that. Although we should talk about this. This is another example of the great Capcom Japan, Capcom USA name change. In Japan, his name is Goki, but Capcom USA decided to change it, but this time it wasn't for fear of any legal repercussions. No, they just didn't like the name. Seriously, that's the reason. They believe Goki just didn't sound very intimidating, so they changed it from Goki to Akuma. And while I will admit I do like Akuma more, it is kind of crazy they changed it just for that reason. Although they did at least keep the name similar enough. Goki translates to Great Demon, and Akuma translates to Devil, so, you know... Potato, Potato, Goki, Akuma, let's call the whole thing off. But what's really important about Akuma isn't his name, it's not his backstory, it's that he's here to beat your ass and beat he will. For starters, you have to unlock the fight by making it all the way through the first 11 arcade fights without losing a match and finishing either in 25 minutes or less or getting a high score. Making this one of the only times a score in a fighting game actually mattered beyond just bragging rights. And remember, on the American version, the game is always locked to the highest difficulty. So getting through all these fights without having to use a continue is insane. But then Akuma on his own is just a pure murder machine. He's fast, does crazy damage, shoots multiple fireballs in the air, can teleport past your attacks, and can combo with moves that no other character can link together. Put all that together and combine it with the input ring and AI, and you have arguably one of the hardest bosses in fighting game history. And hey, I will admit, I do think he's harder in the English version, but I have fought him in both the English and the Japanese version. The Japanese version is still really tough. Even without the broken difficulty bug, he's still one of the hardest fights from any arcade game of this generation. So if you want to beat Akuma, you can't play the round like normal. You have to know the tiny openings that he has. You have to know which moves counter what, which moves are safe, and you have to get your spacing just right. And then, and only then, will you be able to defeat him. Or you can just use save states, that's what I did. Yeah, that clip you just saw was me adding together like 12 different save states, and I have no shame in admitting that. Also, should point out that Akuma was unlockable, but the way to do it was a little bit strange. On the select screen, you have to hover over Ryu for 3 seconds. Then go to T-Hawk and hover over him for 3 seconds. Then Guile for 3 seconds, then Kami for 3 seconds, then back to Ryu for 3 seconds, then tap start, don't hold it, just tap it, and then quickly press all 3 punches together. If you look this up online, everyone is going to tell you that you have to hit start and the 3 punches together. No, trust me, start has to be a split second right before the 3 punches. So that will allow you to play as Akuma, who has his crazy range of moves, he does solid damage, but he is a glass cannon. This is not the boss form of Akuma. He gets hit with a three-hit combo, half his health is gone. So try playing him at your own risk. And if you win, he doesn't get an ending. Instead, it just shows you the losing screen of all the other characters, which... Okay, I will admit, I feel secret characters should also get endings. 
but for the mystery man whose whole gimmick is he just wants to murder everyone? Yeah, okay, that's not bad. So that is Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and as I said, on the competitive scene, this game was a gem. It remains one of the biggest games for Street Fighter. Even today, it's considered a top-notch fighter to play against other people. But did that translate into sales? Well, prepare to be shocked, but this went on to be the highest grossing arcade game in Japan for 1994, meaning that Street Fighter was the highest grossing arcade game in 91, 92, 93, and 94, a four-year streak, at least in Japan. In America, the broken difficulty on this game admittedly did turn some people away, but in the rest of the world, even when people were given the fifth version of Street Fighter 2 within four years, people were still lining up for it. And the legacy of Super Turbo didn't stop at the arcades. Oh no, because this remake of Street Fighter 2 got its own remakes. In 2001 for the Game Boy Advance, there was Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo Revival, which took this game, shrank it down for your pocket, changed some artwork around, and oddly enough, took some stages from later Street Fighters and put them in this game. Also, you can unlock not only Akuma, but Shinokuma, a stronger, darker version of Akuma, who we will talk more about in part two. Then in 2003, for the 15th anniversary of Street Fighter, they released on the PS2 Hyper Street Fighter 2 Anniversary Edition. This has been called the best version of Street Fighter 2 by many players, and there's a reason for that. This is basically every version of Street Fighter 2. When the game begins, you get to pick your speed, and then you get to pick which version of Street Fighter 2 you want to play, and then you can just play that version. The computer will always be set to Super Turbo, however, this game is based on the Japanese version of Super Turbo, so it's not horrendously unfair. But you can pick Super Turbo and play like Super Turbo. But you can also pick Hyper Fighting and then play like Hyper Fighting. You can even pick the original Street Fighter 2 and go up against Turbo characters with a severely limited moveset, but it still keeps the wonky damage scaling of the original game and the stun meter that just changes wildly. I had an original recipe Ryu go up against a Super Turbo Blanca and he suddenly put him in a stun after only two hits and it felt like a fever dream. Now as I said, this game was called the best version of Street Fighter 2 by many players, which made it such a shame that it was locked on the PS2. That is until recently when it was included in the Capcom Fighting Collection, which is an amazing collection by the way. Seriously, if you have any interest in more obscure Capcom fighting games, this is an awesome deal. I highly recommend it. Then for the next few years, not much came from Street Fighter, until David Serlin, producer of the Capcom Classic Collection, suggested making a version of Street Fighter 2 using redrawn sprites. And thanks to the power of the internet, Capcom was hearing from the fans, and they had seen a surge of posts on Capcom's forums of people asking for a high-definition version of Street Fighter. Well, these two factors merged together and led to the approval of our next game, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix. This game took Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo from Matching Service, which was a port of the game made for the Dreamcast in Japan that included online play, and then it was given a handful of balance adjustments, including finding a decent middle ground between all the game's different arcade modes. But the big appeal of this game is that Capcom got in touch with Udon, the comic company who had spent the last several years making Street Fighter comics, and got them to redraw every sprite in the game. They also made brand new endings for all the characters, for example, Ryu, now instead of just skipping out on the award ceremony, pays respects to his master's grave, giving him a little bit more backstory. And because of these graphics and a few small additions, this has become a favorite for many fans, because hey, the Udon team knows how to draw some darn good Street Fighter. Although I will admit it does feel a bit odd seeing these crisp modern day drawings still moving like sprites from over 20 years ago. I get why they couldn't redraw new in-between frames of animation to make it look smoother, that would change every piece of frame day in the game, attacks would have completely different timing, so I get why they had to keep it looking like this, but it does still look weird to me, especially the super stiff background animations. But I will say this is probably one of the best versions of Street Fighter 2, and if you want to play it, then you can still pick it up on the Xbox, or if you've got that PlayStation PS3 streaming service that's available on there. Or if you have a Switch, then you can jump ahead by nine years to 2017 for the final version of Street Fighter 2 so far. I do have to stress that part because if they can make a brand new Street Fighter 2 in 2017, then nothing is impossible. Yes, one of the very first games announced for the Switch was Ultra Street Fighter 2 The Final Challengers. This was an update to HD Remix that included a handful of minor balance changes, as well as including Akuma, no longer as a secret character, 
Evil Ryu, which is a version of Ryu who had been overtaken by the Satsui no Haro, just like Akuma, and Violent Kin. Now, Violent Kin is an odd case. He was a secret evil version of Kin that was created not by Capcom, but by SNK. In the early 2000s, when Capcom and SNK were making a series of crossover games, SNK put out SVC Chaos. And in that game, there is an unlockable version of Kin who had been overtaken with a dark, murderous rage. But not the Satsui no Hato. No, this was the non-union SNK equivalent. Basically, he was inspired by how Kin appeared in the Street Fighter 2 animated movie when he became brainwashed by M. Bison, but we'll talk more about that in a later episode. For now, Violent Kin appearing in this game was a pretty huge landmark because, as I said, he first appeared in a crossover. And nowhere since then. This was the first time that Violent Kin actually appeared in a Capcom game. You can also input a code into this game to unlock Shinokuma, but again, we'll save that for part two. And speaking of saving something for the next episode, that's what it's time to do right now, because we have finally reached the end of Street Fighter 2. Don't get me wrong, we could go into all the home ports and talk about how different they all were, because there is indeed a discussion that you could have there. Did you know they tried to port Hyperfine to the Virtual Boy? Yeah, they put this game out on everything. But you now know the big ins and outs of this legendary game. Street Fighter 2 was a game that created a genre that defined an entire generation of video games. It doesn't matter what your favorite fighting game is, it doesn't matter whether or not you're a competitive or a casual fan of fighters, none of us would be here right now if it weren't for this game. From creating the basics of fighting game combat, to establishing that fighting games can have huge rosters of crazy characters, to making the arcade scene explode and inspire wave after wave of brand new fighting game franchises, the impact of Street Fighter cannot be overstated. And Street Fighter 2's influence specifically went beyond just the world of video games, launching toy lines, animated series, comics, and movies, but we're going to save all that for much later in this retrospective because believe me, those movies have got their own crazy history behind them and we do not have time to start digging through all of this. So instead, I'll just say thank you all for tuning in today. If you want to see part two, then make sure that you hit that subscribe button and ring that bell so that way you'll know when we go live. And you can follow me around the web on all the socials that you can find in the description down below. Also, if you like this video, then please give us a thumb up. It's a small thing, but it really does help. It tells YouTube to spread these videos around. And if you want to spread these videos around yourself, if you know some place where some people might enjoy one of these videos, then hey, share it around. That is also a great way to help us get new viewers, and I really do appreciate it. Thank you all for tuning in today for part one of this monumental series. Stay safe out there, and make sure to come back next time as we finally answer the question, does Capcom actually know how to count to three?